All right, welcome back everyone. Uh, I hope everyone was uh, safe and, and warm and healthy for the past week. I know it's been kind of wild. Um, so we're gonna kind of just jump right in. I'm, I'm doing the PowerPoint that we, the, I'm sorry, the review that I originally would have done last week. I believe I'm on track with your professors. Um, I decided to add a little bit to the end of it from what we will be doing next week, just in case your professors decide to go a little bit quicker. Um, once I hear back, uh, once your professors have had a chance to really update the syllabus, because I know that's been kind of put on the back burner with everything else going on, and uh, adjust kind of due dates and things like that, I'll, I'll adjust my reviews from there. But for now, we're kind of working on what I would have been uh, working with you all on last week. So the first question that I have here is, what are the steps in protein sequencing? So before I jump into that, let's talk about protein sequencing in general. So this chapter is all about identifying and understanding proteins. Uh, this chapter, I really should say this, this unit. Um, and so we, um, <clears throat> excuse me. So the idea of a protein sequence is being able to say this amino acid, then this amino acid, then this amino acid, all the way through however many amino acids that protein has, in that order, make this protein. And so in order to do that, we have to, um, we have to do a couple of steps. So we can identify proteins. The, the issue is we can identify proteins really accurately when they're in small polypeptide chains. So maybe 10, maybe 50, maybe 100 chains, depending on the machine, uh, I'm sorry, 100 uh, residues per chain, depending on how good your, uh, your machine is. And so we have to break it up into those chains. Great, that's fine and all. But before we do that, we have to be able to get it into one long straight chain. And so I just want to kind of talk about that. Now let's jump into the actual step specifically. So first, we separate the non-covalently linked chains. So this is stuff like if you have a quaternary structure, we're going to get rid of the polypeptide and leave only monomers, because we, we can only identify a single monomer, and then we'll identify the other monomer and put those together. Like So we have to sequence each chain individually. Next. Disulfide bonds are a covalent linkage. However, they are not a part of our primary structure. That's our goal, really, is to bring this down to its primary structure. So the first two steps, get rid of the non-covalent chains and then the covalent chains that are not peptide bonds, okay? Our third step is to cleave proteins into peptides using either spe uh, sequence-specific proteases or chemicals. So some of the proteases we talk about uh, toward the end of this chapter will always cleave between arginine and and, um, and methionine or something like that. And so those are really helpful. Chemicals can do something similar. Again, chemicals are also talked about in this chapter. Um, okay. So then once we've done that, we isolate and separate our peptides. So this is where kind of last week's unit comes in. We're going to use all those uh, techniques that we learned about last week, things like um, excuse me, things like PAGE and STS PAGE can be really helpful to separate peptides out uh, based on size. If they have different polarities, maybe we'll be using a different type of chromatography. If there are, you know, a million other ways that we can separate based on just kind of the stuff we did last week. We can salt one of them out um, and maybe the others will stay dissolved and so we can separate it that way. Um, okay, so then, so let's kind of talk about what we've done. The first two steps are leave only primary structure. Structure, okay? Our third and fourth step are basically break this long chain into various pieces so that we can identify those pieces. So this is just to get each of these little individual chains so that we can do stuff with them. That's three and four. Step five is sequence them from the N terminus, which is called an Edmund degradation, or the C terminus, which is called, which is using carboxypeptidases. Okay, so what we've done here is we've said, okay, so this chain right here that we cut out, this chain's amino acid sequence is A, K, Y, dot, 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 dot. And then this second chain over here, this one's amino acid sequence is M, C, you know, D, dot, 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 dot. All right, that's great. And it is really helpful to have all of that. But the reason that we have step six is because that doesn't tell us the whole story. That tells us that this chain has this amino acid sequence. And this chain has this amino acid sequence. And this chain has this one. We don't know how they fit together. And that's why we do step six. 
we repeat using a different one. So maybe we'll use trypsin for the first prote as our first protease, and then we'll use chymotrypsin for our second one because they cleave at different places. Or we'll use a different, an entirely different protease or an entirely different chemical, whatever the case may be. We want to cleave at a different place. Why? Because maybe the second time I do it, I'll get something like dot, 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 AK, and then the next one will start Y dot, 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 M. And so I'll say, okay, so this is this part right here, and it connects to this, which, which eventually leads to this, or something like that. And so we can kind of put it together like puzzle pieces. And I'll show an example in a little bit, but I just want to go over that. So then finally, assemble the full sequence. So these are the four steps that I use. The seven steps are the, the more rigorous approach, the, the really technical one. Here's how I think of it. Step one is step one and two, exactly like I said. Break every non-peptide bond to leave only the primary structure. Then two, three, or I'm sorry, three, four, and five, I consider to be one again. Cleave and sequence peptide fragments. So now we understand the sequence, or we understand this, yeah, the sequence of each fragment. Then repeat step two to get multiple different ones. That's uh, step six. And finally, put together the sequence or assemble the full sequence. Okay. So now let's talk a little bit more in depth with some of these steps. So step one, like we said, is separate the non-covalent link chains. Okay. Well, which of these methods is not effective at separating non-covalent link chains? You have extreme pH, high salt, kaotropes, and to be honest, I'm not 100% certain that's how you pronounce it. Um, and reducing agents. So, and, and when I say high salt, I wanna make sure that I emphasize this. This isn't just any salt. This is using specific salts, something like uh, the one that your professors will have given an example when they talk about one of these four things is ammonium sulfate. Ammonium sulfate is a great example, okay? So, I, I, Let's talk about what kaotropes are before we jump into the answer to this question. A kaotrope is a protein denaturant. So a really common example of that is urea, okay? Now, I kind of did spoil it because I did say it's a denaturant and something that denatures is something that removes non-covalent, non-covalent bonds. So we know that C is, is effective at separating these chains, okay? And I'll, I'll go ahead and, and just give you guys the answer. Um, pH and salt are also quite effective. Um, and so the answer to this one is actually reducing agents. Reducing agents are excellent at what they do, but in this case, they have nothing to do with, um, with the non-covalent link chains because they actually, they deal with actual bonds, and so they deal with covalent chains. Okay, and on that note, let's talk about disulfide bonds, which, as I don't know if you guys are aware, they are actually redox reactions. Okay, so the reason that number two is, is in my opinion, a pretty tricky question, because I, I don't like number two, I think it's, it's weird, is because reducing agents remove disulfide bonds. Okay, so now let's talk about which amino acid forms those bonds. So I, I've only given you guys two options, methionine and cysteine, and both are um, both are sulfur-containing amino acids. So methionine, its side chain has, I believe, two carbons, oops, two carbons, uh, and then a sulfur, and then another carbon group. Cysteine, on the other hand, has a single carbon group and then a thiol. Okay. So given that it is, in fact, an oxidation-reduction reaction, given that it's redox. The only choice left is D. It has to be cysteine because methionine is much more difficult to draw into a redox reaction. Yes, it's got electrons, and so it can react, but this has both hydrogen and electrons. And so it's able to donate its proton. It's able to accept bonds. It's able to donate electrons and so on. And so cysteine is really, really, really versatile. And so one of them, one, or I should say, one cysteine uh, residue will donate its proton to the other. The other will donate electrons. So this one will donate electrons. This one will donate its, its proton. And so the redox reactions happen between two cysteine residues. Okay, does that make sense to everyone? I hope. 
Um, if not, please ask. Okay. Uh, I was hoping I would keep that cut off. Okay. So draw the cleavage of trypsin in the peptide in the peptide ART. Okay. So what you guys see here on this right side is some of the. So let's let's go back up here real quick. There are sequence-specific proteases and there are chemicals. What you see here is just the proteases. Okay, the chemicals are separate, and each protease is able to cleave at a certain point. So trypsin, which is what we were dealing with right now, and I'm going to highlight this because it's very important for this question, but also I believe trypsin is always one of the ones we have to memorize for this class. It cleaves to the carbonyl side of a basic amino acid. Okay. Um, on that note, I want to add real quick, trypsin, you almost always have to memorize. Different professors have different requirements. So for all I know, you don't have to memorize trypsin at all. You have to memorize chymotrypsin. I, from what I remember, trypsin was almost always one of the ones used, which is why I include it. But um, always, always, always ask your professors over asking me. I'm not an expert in what your professor is going to require. Okay. All right. So let's actually address this question. So ART is alanine, arginine, and uh, let's see. Three anine, there we go. Um, so when we go to draw these, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to start with my N terminus. And I'm gonna say, and I, I'm gonna draw everything neutral for now. I, I know that they may have charges at whatever pH for now, I'm just gonna draw everything neutral for simplicity's sake. So this is my N terminus, my central carbon. Uh, it's got a hydrogen and it's got the C terminus, which I'm not gonna draw yet. It's R group for alanine is a CH3. Okay, awesome. All right, and then I don't know if you guys remember this well, so I'm just, uh, I'm going to make sure to go through it. The, the C terminus is the carbonyl, and then it's an amide. So we have a nitrogen here with a hydrogen, and then we go to the central carbon of the next amino acid, which in this case is arginine. I'm going to draw its hydrogen. And then arginine has, see if I remember this, one, two, three, four, I believe. One, two, three, four carbons. And then a nitrogen. Single bond to another carbon, which is then bound to NH, and then double bound to NH. Oh, and I think this is a two. And uh, there's a nitrogen right here, I believe. Uh, NH2, excuse me. I think that's correct. Okay. All right. So there's the R group of um, of arginine, excuse me. Um, and then I go up, carbonyl, nitrogen, and then I'm to the central carbon of threonine. I know it's got a hydrogen. I'm going to go ahead and draw the C terminus first in this case since it's that. And I know that threonine is. <clears throat> ah, I just realized this is incorrect. I don't know why I drew this nitrogen here. I apologize. That was me getting myself confused. Please excuse me. Um, so this is still one, two, three, four, if I'm not mistaken. Um, let me double check that. Oh, it's only three. Apologies. It has been a little while since I've had to draw this, especially with the, um, the, the power. One, two, three, and then two, the nitrogen. There we go. That's better. Um, right, so threonine is a single, or it, it's really an ethyl group with an OH off the, the first carbon, okay? So trypsin cleaves on the carbonyl side of arginine or lysine. Well, arginine is, and I'm going to highlight this in green, this thing, and it cleaves at the carbonyl side. So this is the carbonyl of arginine. Oh, excuse me. So this specifically is what I'm looking at, the carbonyl side. So trypsin is going to cleave right here. Trypsin cleavage. So you don't need to know the exact mechanism of action of any of these uh, proteases, of any of the, um, the chemicals that are going to cleave things. But what you would need to know is I'm going to draw AR and I'm going to draw T. So this would be what I'm left with. Uh, you can draw a slash between them. You can say A, R, T, something like that. That's what we do need to be aware of because this is most likely what you're going to be asked about. What will be remaining after the cleavage of trypsin from the peptide ART? Something like that. Okay. All right. 
So uh, this is, I believe, step six it was. Uh, no, sorry, step five. So now we sequence our peptides. We use either the Edmund degradation or we use carboxypeptidases. And I, I know that the answer is up there, but I, I want to take this time to kind of talk about each of those processes. So, <clears throat> um, okay, so the Edmund degradation. This is, in my opinion, one of the weirder ones. Uh, I am not super fond of it because I think it's a little bit confusing, but what it does is it reacts with the amino group of an amino acid or of an amino acid residue, so the, pep the, pep of, the of the peptide, excuse me, with a kind of big structure that's got a benzene ring to it. That's all I really remember. Um, and what it, that big structure does is it gives us a UV absorbance, especially when it's bound to a specific amino acid. So when, it's, when this uh, phenyl something uh, is bound to an amino acid, it gives us an absorbance. And that absorbance tells us exactly what amino acid we're dealing with. Excuse me. And so, um, and so we do that, cleave it, or I should say cleave that, that first uh, amino acid on the end terminus, bind our next uh, reagent to our new end terminus, uh, take the UV of that one to identify it, cleave, bind, cleave, and so on and so forth. And so it, it, it's a little bit of a long process, but what it does is it identifies things from the end terminus because it has to bind to the end terminus, okay? I'm going to go ahead and just say the answer is B, um, like it says right here, and terminus, D terminus. You guys obviously knew that. Um, okay, now carboxypeptidases. So carboxypeptidase will cleave the C terminus rather than the N terminus. And the way that, and it basically we, it lets us identify the residues. Um, the issue with carboxypeptidases is the identification step isn't, like instant, basically. And so the what happens is sometimes if you can cleave one residue quickly, you can identify it quickly. But if you cleave one, and it, it takes quite some time, let's say, and then you cleave the next one really quickly, you may, you may end up getting kind of two different results at almost the same time. And so it can be a little bit difficult to, um, to really interpret sometimes, depending on, on the rate of cleavage, but it does generally work quite well. All right, so that is steps one and two, steps three and four, step five, and we've talked about how you can do step six. Now let's talk about step seven, okay? So given the following cleavages from two different enzymes, assemble the correct sequence. So if you have, and this one is a little bit easy, obviously, but um, I did wanna show this. So enzyme one, I have lost my mouse. Give me one second, there it is. Um, Enzyme 1 cleaved between K and A and between T and D. Enzyme 2 cleaved between D and K. And so as we can tell, L, then I, then Q, then K, the next one needs to be an A. And it is. Okay. Um, if I had wanted to, I could have flipped these two to make sure that you guys weren't just putting them together because that would be fair game. Um, your professor may decide to reverse one of them. I know that that's kind of unintuitive since we've been saying N terminus to C terminus, um, but it's fair game because it should be fairly straightforward to put together as long as you're really careful. What I suggest you do is look for kind of a series of three peptides or three amino acids. So IQK, match that up between two different ones, uh, between your two different cleavages, or if you have three, your three different cleavages, um, if you can, and then work from there. So in this case, I know I, Q, and K are right next to an A, and I know that the only option is either here, 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 or here. There's only one K, which means that K goes to A, R, D, T. Now I know D and T have to be next to each other. So in this case, again, your only option is a T or a K. It has to be a T. And so these are, you know, together. So the answer to this one ends up being A. Okay. That said, be very careful. Um, don't get mixed up. The ones on enzyme one cleavage and the ones on enzyme two cleavage are separate. So don't accidentally combine from here to here or something like that. Only combine within the same, however it's delivered to you, whether it's row, column, whatever the case may be. Only to come, uh, or really only put together, I guess is the better way to put it. The ones that come from the same cleavage, okay? 
it's it's unfortunately a more common mistake than I, I, I'd love to have, but yes. Um, okay, so that was kind of an older way of doing things because it takes quite a bit of work. Um, there is fortunately a pretty, or not a pretty easy, but an easier way to do it now. Okay, and that easier way to do it is called mass spectrometry. There are two kinds of mass spectrometry that we're going to talk about today, ESI and MOLDI. So as you guys can tell, eight and nine, I do go into quite a bit of depth on each of them. Um, for now, I'm just going to tell you guys the very bare overview until we get to eight and nine so that we can answer steps, uh, question seven. So effectively what we do is both of them will, uh, will kind of introduce a, a proton or neutron, or, I'm sorry, a proton or an electron, usually a proton, into, um, into your proton, I'm sorry, into your protein or your peptide. And what we get out of it, and I'm just gonna scroll to number 10, just for a, number 11, excuse me, for a quick image, is you get some kind of mass charge ratio and then a relative intensity peak uh, graph, excuse me. The actual graph itself doesn't matter, or the, the relative intensity part doesn't matter too much for the purposes of this class. I know when you did mass spectrometry in organic chemistry, that mattered because that told your stability. We don't really talk about it this much. Um, but the, the, the basic difference is ESI will give you a single proton and then another proton and then another proton. And so you get this series of peaks. And actually, this is an example, I believe, from your textbook. Um, you get the series of peaks. This has 17 protons. This has 18. This one has 19. This one has 20 and so on. And so you can use that with neighboring peaks to figure out your, your mass of your overall peptide. And we're going to show you guys the math for it later. Just wanted to walk uh, to introduce that. So ESI does. MALDI introduces a single charge and gives you the, um, the outcome, basically. So, um, all right, so now that we've shifted to number eight, MALDI stands for Matrix Assisted Laser Desorption Ionization. It's a lot of words. We don't really have to worry about it too much. Um, Effectively, what happens is your, your matrix is a light absorbing substance. You introduce light. Um, and so um, you tend to only get a MALDI for intact proteins. So you'll get the, the spectrum, and it, it'll be protein A with a positive one charge, protein B with positive two charge, protein three with positive three, and so on and so forth. You almost never or you don't get fragmentation from it is what I mean to say. Okay, so um, let's see. No fragmentation. Tation. Almost always, and the reason I say almost always is because some proteins will take on a charge greater than plus one. Some will be plus two or plus three. Um, and in that case, obviously, it's a little bit different. Um, almost always plus one charge, but you'll be able to see that. On the other hand, ESI, ESI stands for electrospray ionization, okay? Uh, and uh, this electrospray ionization um, introduces lots of charges, introduces lots of charges, almost always plus one charges, or I should say almost always protons once again. So you get plus one and plus two and plus three, dot, 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 dot. Okay. So like I said, the, the key here is neighboring peaks, neighboring peaks differ by one proton. One proton. Okay. And, and I'm going to explain why in the next question when we do an example of, uh, of kind of what we're dealing with, but neighboring peaks differ by a single proton and we use that for the math. Okay, but effectively what you get from ESI is just a ton of, um, of, um, of charges and a ton of peaks. So it's this one, like I showed you guys, you get a ton of them, okay? So let's actually do an example of the math. So, and by the way, all of this math, completely fair game on an exam, on a quiz, problem section, or I'm sorry, not problem section, problem set, all of those things, you're very likely to see something like this on it, okay? So this question, I'm going to do the long way. The second question, I'm going to do the easier way, OK? So two peaks emerged. This means neighboring peaks, OK? 
first peak gave you this number, the second peak at this number. What are these numbers? These are charge to mass, M to Z ratios, okay? So the way that I like to think of this is, okay, what is the charge to mass ratio? So I'm gonna do this with the 842.7. I'm gonna say, okay, what contributes to the mass? The mass of the overall peptide contributes plus every proton contributes one uh, Dalton. Okay, and what contributes to the charge? Well, just the number of protons. Great, that's resolved. Okay, all right. Now 912.3 is the same thing. Uh, oops, um, M plus Z contribute to the mass and then Z. However, if we were to say that M is the same for both of these and Z is the same for both of these, then that would mean that 912 is equal to 842. And we obviously know that that's not the case. So the, the fact that these are neighboring peaks tells us they differ by a single proton. In other words, one of these is Z is equal, uh, like, let's see, Z naught, let's call it, is equal to Z. One of these, Z naught is equal to Z plus one. And by Z naught, I mean is the actual charge. Z is the variable that we're using for it, okay? So we have to figure out which of these is the Z plus one. So this, in my opinion, is one of the, the less intuitive parts of this. I'm gonna tell you guys right now, it, it's this one. Um, I know some of you guys are gonna be confused or not like that very much. The rationale behind this is when I add one to the, the numerator, we're usually dealing with um, like masses of our proteins somewhere around the, the tens of kilodaltons, right? So 10,000, 50,000, 80,000 are pretty normal masses for our, our uh, proteins. When you add one to that, that makes very little difference. Charges, you could be looking at a charge of 70. When you add one to that, it makes a much bigger difference. And so your denominator is increasing at a higher rate than your numerator. So the smaller number, so because 842 is less than 912, it gets the M plus Z plus one over Z plus one, okay? I hope that makes sense. If it doesn't, don't worry, we're gonna go through the math, okay? So how do we figure out the charge? Well, the charge we're looking for is Z. And sorry, I'm just gonna clear this so I have a little bit more space. Um, the charge we're looking for is Z. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna set up this system of equations. We have two equations. If we isolate M, we can set the M's equal to each other and then solve for Z. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna isolate M in both cases. So um, for convenience, when I'm using, or uh, no, I'm gonna use red and green. I don't know why, I just, okay. So I'm gonna use green for this equation and red for this one, just so we don't get anything mixed up. So first thing I'm gonna do with my red equation is I'm gonna multiply Z plus one to both sides is equal to M plus Z plus one, and then I'm gonna subtract Z plus one from both sides. So 842.7 Z plus one minus, and I'm gonna draw Z plus one. I'm gonna keep it in parentheses, and the reason I'm gonna do that is because then I can subtract 842.7 minus one. 841.7 Z plus one ends up equaling M, okay? Then green equation, I'm gonna do something very similar. It is 912.3 times Z, since I'm just gonna multiply Z over, is equal to M plus Z, subtract Z from both sides, 911.3 is equal, uh, sorry, 911.3 Z is equal to M. Z equals M. And now we know that our molar masses are equal. They have to be, right? Because we're talking about the same protein here. Therefore, I can set these equations equal to each other. So for the sake of convenience, I'm not going to, um, uh, what's it called? I'm not gonna keep changing colors um, since we're dealing with one equation now. 11.3 okay. So now at this stage, I'm gonna distribute. So 841.7Z plus 841 is equal to 911.3Z, okay? And I, I hope we're okay with cleaning this up from here. Excuse me, just had something fall. Uh, no problem. Okay. We're just going to take 911.3z, subtract 841.7z, and we're going to get 69.6 is equal to that 841.7. And I apologize, I dropped the 0.7 here. I didn't actually notice that. Um, and then from here, we're just going to divide to solve. 
and we're going to get that z is equal to um, equals 12.09. You're going to get results like this pretty much every time. Not necessarily the 12th part, but this 0 0.09. Um, it's not unexpected to get something like something 0.1 or something 0 0.08 or 0 0.05 or 0.95 or 0.98 or whatever the case may be. Um, because remember, we're dealing with protons. So we should be dealing with pretty close to whole numbers. Obviously, it's not always going to be perfect. Um, it doesn't always work like that just because of rounding and things like that. And so for convenience, we're just going to say the charge is 12. OK? Um, it's important to note that the charge Z is 12 for this peak and is 13 for this peak. So 12 at 9, 12.3, 13 at 842.7. OK? And the reason is this. Z is the charge at the heavier or at the, the bigger M to Z number. Z plus one is the charge at the lower M to plus Z number. At M over Z, excuse me. Um, okay, and now we have, in, in my opinion, the easy step once you've done all of this hard work and system of equation nonsense is what is the mass? Well, I'm just going to take this equation because it's easier and I'm going to say 912.3 equals M plus 12 over 12. And therefore, M must be. And that's it. Um, it's a much, much easier system because you just have to multiply and then subtract. And the number you get out of it is 10.9 kilodalton. That's it. <laughs> See? That one was a lot easier. OK. So there's an easier way to do this. So. I'm trying to see. I think we have enough time. I'd like to, to kind of derive this formula for you all since it's, it's not too hard. I wasn't sure if we had enough time. So this is the formula. Um, I'm just going to show you how we get there. Um, let me make sure I have this correct because I, I always get this part mixed up with which one's heavier and which one's the lighter one. So when we're solving this, I believe if I remember correctly, x is the bigger number. Mm, oh, wait, hang on. It's right there. I'm, I'm getting into my own head. X is the bigger number. That's correct. So if I'm going to say x is greater than y. Okay, So that means that x is equal to m plus z over z, and y is equal to m plus z plus 1 over z plus 1. Okay, And I'm going to do the exact same thing I did up here. I'm going to isolate the m's. Okay, So x, z minus z equals m, y, z plus 1 minus z plus 1 equals m. And then I'm just going to clean this up real quick. So it's going to be x minus 1 times z is equal to y minus 1 times, there we go, times z plus 1. OK? Um, and now we need to solve for z, which is a little bit tedious, but it's not too bad. Um, I'm just going to divide y minus 1 from both sides. No, no, I'm sorry. That's that's not correct. I, I forget that step. Um, I'm going to to distribute y minus one on the right side. So I'm going to get x minus one times z equals y minus one again times z plus y minus one. Okay. Then I'm going to subtract this to the left side. So x minus one times z minus y minus one times z is equal to y minus 1. Then, so the way that this ends up going is I can just clean up the, the coefficients, right? So it ends up being x minus 1, I'm going to put this in a bracket, minus y minus 1, but not a good y, y minus 1, times z is equal to y minus 1. So then over here, distribute the negative. So it ends up being x minus 1 minus y plus 1. Minus 1 and plus 1 cancel, and you get x minus y times z equals y minus 1. And you're going to divide by x, o, x minus y to get this. Okay. So this formula is everything we just did in that, that big, long process for number 10. Just really easy. <laughs> um, 
And so I'm just going to show you guys an example using number 11. Okay, so number 11 says the ESI mass spectrum of myoglobin is shown. Using it, calculate the charge of on myoglobin at X1 and the mass of myoglobin. So the charge at X1, so it tells us right here, X1 is that 998.2, X2 is 942.8. We obviously know that the charge is 17 because it says it, but let's let's solve it algebraically. Okay. So remembering that Z is equal to Y minus 1 over X minus Y. And remembering that X is the larger number. And the reason we can always remember this is because if it weren't, the bottom would give us a negative. So X is always the larger number. So we're going to say 942.8 minus 1 over 998.2 minus 942.8. Okay. I'm going to give you all a second because I want to I want everyone to plug it into their calculators to just see how much easier that is. Um, okay, and the number we get out of it is indeed 17, just like that. It's that easy. And remembering again, what is Z? Z is the charge at, let's, let's go back up here. Z is the charge at the heavier or the larger M to Z ratio. In other words, Z is the charge at 998. If it were asking us for the charge at X2, oh, oops, this is X1, excuse me. If it were asking us for the charge at X2, it would be 18 at X2, okay? All right, and then finally it asks us B, what is the mass of myoglobin? So for B, we're just gonna say, excuse me, um, uh, okay, there's my mouse, I apologize. Um, 998.2, Point two is equal to the mass plus 17 over 17. That easy. And once again, we just say 998.2 times 17 minus 17. The number we end up getting is about 17.0 kilodalton. Just like that. Easy. Um, so yeah, so I, I personally think ESI is really fun once you get used to it because it's really interesting and it cleans up so beautifully. Um, a lot of people don't agree, but that's fine. <laughs> um, okay. So, given the following Maldi mass spectrum, rank them by mass from highest to low. So I'm going to zoom up just a little bit so we can see everything. So this is what you'll usually get for Maldi, a single number for every protein. Okay. The reason for that is because I mean, that's what you get. Um, it only introduces a single proton. So down here, we once again have M to Z ratios, okay? So in this case, we're looking at about 17,000 for, oh, sorry, for myoglobin. I should have said that. Myoglobin is about 17,000 over, in this case, it's charges plus one. Okay, that tells us mass is going to equal 17,000. Um, oh, I, I should have set this up differently. I apologize. It should be 17,000 should equal mass over plus one. That would have been a more correct way to draw it, okay? Um, this one, I am willing to call that about 1250, 12,500. Um, and that's once again equal to the mass over a charge of one. The charge ends up being 1250, or 125, excuse me. This one, um, this is probably actually a little bit lower than uh, 12,500. That's okay. This one was called 8,500 for ubiquitin. Uh, 8,500 over mass, and then the charge is once again plus one. Just realized, I don't think I ever explained where the charge comes from. If we look at this, brackets, and then plus. So when you have, for example, sodium, we only put Na plus because the number is irrelevant. That tells us it's plus one. So this ends up being 8,500 for ubiquitin. This cytochrome is a little bit different. As I'm sure you guys can tell, there's a two here. Um, so that too kind of changes things because this is, let's say around 6,500. Oh, excuse me, not 5,000. Equals the mass over two. And so what ends up happening is we have to double this to get 12,500, which tells us that cytochrome and cytochrome C have similar molar masses. Um, obviously we can't get too specific just because um, it, it's not the most accurate system we have here. So let's call this 12,300 just for the sake of the ranking, since it is a little bit less than the 500, which would be here. Um, and this one we'll keep at uh, 12,5, okay? And so this wants us to rank 
from highest to lowest, the highest mass is myoglobin. The next highest is cytochrome. The next highest uh, on the next line is cytochrome C. Oh, I just realized this is the wrong uh, sign. I apologize. Um, cytochrome. And then finally is ubiquitin. So you're not asked a lot of question about a lot of questions about MALDI, to be honest. It, it doesn't, you know, open itself up for some beautiful math the way ESI does. Um, but that said, I, I do think that it's important to know, and that's why I did go over this. Um, hopefully, you'll be able to get a more accurate number if you're given a MALDI than just having to estimate. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm going to keep this up for a moment just to make sure if anyone has any questions. But um, And I'll just give myself a chance to get a drink of water. But yeah, uh, that's, that's just about everything you need to know for MALDI. And I hope we're OK with ESI. It is a little bit more complicated, but I, I think it's OK. Okay, all right, jumping into the next question. What type of structure is the disulfide bridge? Um, there we go. So this is a question that I have heard several different answers about. Um, and admittedly, I go back and forth on this because I personally have always learned that it was tertiary. However, I've recently been told by, uh, by some professors that it's considered primary. So the reason that I include this question is twofold. The first, you, you do need to know. The second is ask your professors. If you're not sure, ask. Um, the way that I had learned it would be tertiary. However, I've recently heard a definition that primary is the only one that has covalent linkages, and so it can be considered a type of primary structure. So I err toward the side of saying it's primary, um, despite personally disagreeing with that. Um, however, I would encourage you Fact check this with your professor. It very well could be tertiary. I'll, I'll highlight that in a different color to make it clear. It could be tertiary. I, I cannot give you a definite answer, which is why I really encourage y'all to ask. Okay. All right. So we're going to work ahead a little bit, like I said, just because time, um, or because of everything that happened last week. So we're talking today about phi and psi angles. So Phi and psi angles and, and the Ramchandran plot are ways of understanding secondary structures. And what I mean by that is secondary structures are fairly fixed. So if you have, for example, an alpha helix or a beta sheet, those are the two common secondary structures we talk about. I can tell you about how your alpha helix will look without needing to learn a ton of detail. Right? I don't need to know about this specific protein to know if it has an alpha helix, that alpha helix will behave like this. It'll have this property, dot, 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 okay? Same goes for beta sheets. Beta sheets are very, very common. They're very, very similar to each other. There are different types of beta sheets, but overall, they're very similar. And that's what kind of causes um, that's how we that's why we identify them using these angles so as you guys can tell by this drawing the phi angle is the angle between a carbon or let's say this central carbon right here and um i guess i'll, I'll use blue since they use blue and the nitrogen on its end terminus so the phi angle or phi i, I think it's phi but i'm not certain um angle between carbon nitrogen bond okay that's it not too hard i hope all right now the red as you guys can tell is the psi angle the psi angle is almost exactly the same it's the angle between the carbon and the c terminus um so psi i'm a little bit worse at drawing um is the angle between carbon and carbon, okay? Oh, excuse me. Um, there we go, okay? So that opens up what we call this Ramachandran plot. And this is a little bit of a not as good looking one because I didn't wanna um, give away all of the labels. The reason behind not wanting to give away the labels is these kinds of, of colored regions that you see, like this one up here and this one and this one, 
represent different secondary structures. Okay, I'm going to focus on three regions today, and with those three regions, four secondary structures, because those are the, the big four that you have to memorize. And they are the right-handed alpha helix and left-handed alpha helix and uh, alpha helices and the parallel and anti-parallel well there we go parallel beta sheets okay so we are going to talk about the these in a little bit more depth possibly next week possibly this week depending on time i, I do have next week or what would have been this week's um review prepared um it just it really does depend on time so this area right here in red this dark red is where you'll find every beta sheet both right hand or i'm sorry both parallel anti-parallel they all end up here okay so what this tells us is they have pretty fixed phi and psi angles oh, i'm spoiling it a little bit down there um you and i'm actually just going to show this next one off since i i did kind of accidentally spoil it what you guys see here is the full ramachandran plot this is a, i think a much better one that actually shows what we're trying to show this one is a little bit more rigid so anti-parallel and parallel beta sheets tend to have slightly different phi and psi angles, but they're close enough that we just kind of lump them together. They also end up appearing near collagen helix, but that one isn't one that we talk about with respect to the Ramachandran plot in this class, so I wouldn't worry about it. The right-handed helix has a phi angle between like negative 45 and negative 90, and its psi angle is, it can vary a bit, okay? The left-handed helix, on the other hand, and what we mean by that, I just realized they never explained, if it rises kind of rotating as you would rotate your right hand, then it's a right-handed helix. If it rises rotating as you would rotate your left hand, it's a left-handed helix, okay? Left-handed helices are very fixed. Their phi angles are pretty much always negative 60 degrees. Their psi angles are, are a little bit more, um, have a little bit of a wider range, but they tend to be around negative 45. I'm sorry, positive 45. Please excuse me. Um, and so it is fair game on an exam for your professor to say, or not to say rather, but to show this Ramachandran plot and to say, what secondary structure do I have here? And obviously it's not here, but it's still a right-handed helix because we consider this entire region the right-handed helices. What secondary structure do we have here or here? And then if you were to pick this one, it would be beta sheet in general, not necessarily parallel or anti-parallel. Um, it's, it's too hard to tell the difference in this class, okay? All right, so what the Ramachandran plot can tell you is which secondary structures are present, D. Okay, I hope that makes sense. Um, if it doesn't, please you know interrupt me, ask questions. Um, and if you have other questions after this, by the way, feel free to reach out um, or feel free to, uh, to, to stop by drop-in tutoring. We're open 11 till 8 p.m., okay? So there are more questions. I just, I wanna pause for a moment because I'm going to, um, I'm gonna share a different OneNote file so that we can start going into next week's. And basically with next week, we're just gonna, or with, with this, we're just gonna get done as much as we can get done. Um, I, I understand that I am kind of, pushing us a little bit too far, or not too far, but a little bit further than your professor may have gotten simply because of the, the storm. But I do, do want to do my best to get you all prepared for your exam. So if, um, if your professors end up delaying the exam by about a week, then you'll just be a little bit extra prepared. Um, and we'll do similar questions, but not the exact same. Um, so while I get this OneNote file kind of loaded, um, and I apologize, I don't know why it is taking as long as it is, um, I did rush through the first chapter, or the first, like, week four, basically. Um, I, I apologize that I had to. It was not ideal, obviously. Um, but I, I do hope that it made some sense. Um, if y'all have any questions, again, feel free, ask anytime. Um, Drop-in tutoring always of, or is always available, um, things like that. We, we do want to be a resource for you guys if we can, if we can, okay? Um, all right. So let me, again, I, I do apologize. It's not wanting to load. Um, all 
Okay. Um, we are, there we go. Okay. I apologize for that delay. I don't know why it took so long. Um, okay. So I, I went ahead and kept this from, um, from my notes. Um, so what I'm sharing right now is my notes as well as the, the review. I, I usually make kind of two copies. One is the review, one is my notes on the reviews, just so I know what I'm doing. Because um, I, I don't want to be wrong when I give you guys information. Um, so this is kind of a review from what we would have been doing last week, which we ended up doing just two minutes ago. Um, so this, this next week, is, is going to be focused a lot on secondary structures, alpha helices and beta sheets, obviously. Um, but it's it's not just learning about the structure, it's about learning the, the size and orientation and shape and, and the details of the structure. So the way an alpha helix works, and I'm going to, excuse me, I'm going to just draw helix first, um, is the N terminus and the C terminus, or, yeah, are going that way, let's say. But the N terminus, uh, like the amine groups will pop up. The carboxylic or the carbonyl group, I should say, from an amino acid a few, pro uh, a few residues away, and we're gonna talk about the specific numbers later, will hydrogen bond with it. So this is an NH. They'll, do, they'll have hydrogen bonding between the one, uh, let's just, I don't know, R, um, and then dot, 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 dot. So then coming off of this carbon, oxygen, and then dot, 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 and then uh, this is going to have a different R group. So, okay, so this is what it looks like. This, and this should actually be a dotted line, so ignore that, dotted. This is what stabilizes an alpha helix, that the N terminus of an amino acid residue will hydrogen bond with the C terminus of the residue for amino acids later. Um, I, I don't know exactly how, I, how that would have been worded, but it'll, if you're in your sequence, um, amino acid one, and amino acid five will have hydrogen bonding between them. amino acid five and amino acid nine, two and six, and so on. Okay. All right. Now let's talk about the numbers. Right. Length of length of helix per number of amino acid. This is uh, what you're really being tested on. Um. <clears throat> so there are. I'm trying to think to make sure I get these. There are three numbers that most people will memorize. You only have to memorize two. I'm going to give you all three just in case you need them. Okay. So the number of amino acids per turn is about four. And I hope that makes sense, right? Because if I'm looking at a circle, right, this can only amino acid or this can only bond with something pretty much directly under or above it. Um, so it is about four. The number specifically is 3.6 residues per one turn of an amino acid. Okay. In other words, if I'm at a position, if I'm in you know position one directly above me on this um, alpha helix is 3.6 amino acid residues later. It's not perfect um, in the sense that it's not exactly four, but you're you're close to four, basically. Um, okay, all right, so the next thing is, this is the second, there we go. The second big number you have to memorize with respect to alpha helices is 5.4. And that 5.4 is 5.4 angstroms per one turn of, oops, one turn or as it's called, one pitch. Pitch and turn are the same thing, okay? So real quick, I'm just gonna mention 5.4 angstroms is the same thing as 0.54 nanometers, okay? If you want it in scientific notation, one angstrom is equal to one times 10 to the negative 10th meters, okay? Hope that helps. I, I don't know, I personally just think of it in terms of nanometers if I need to, but I know some people, excuse me, prefer meters. Okay, 
The third number that you may decide to know, um, and this is really you can do all the math you need with these two numbers, but some people prefer to kind of combine them because it, it is a little bit easier. 1.5. And specifically, it's 1.5 angstroms per amino acid residue. Amino acid residue. Um, so the reason that some people will use this number instead is this number is equal to 5.4 angstroms per one turn divided by 3.6 residues per one turn. So it, it's really, this is those two numbers. I just, I think some people prefer that 1.5. And so I want to make sure that I explain where it comes from and kind of why it, it is the way it is. Okay. All right. So this is some of the examples are of kind of how, um, how this question can be, or how, how questions can be asked about this. So you're given a peptide with 34 amino acids adopting an alpha helix configuration. Okay. So two things are really important to note here. First, in this case, every single amino acid is in, is a part of this alpha helix. That is not always the case. Okay. Obviously some proteins have an alpha helix and then you know, a little bit of a gap and then another alpha helix or an alpha helix and then a beta sheet and then another alpha helix or whatever. Um, different proteins have different secondary structures. So be very mindful of what the question is asking you. 34 amino acids of which half are alpha helices is a very different question, for example. Okay. So how many turns, excuse me, how many turns will this helix contain? So like we said, a turn is the same as a pitch. It's basically one loop from this point to this exact point, 3.6 residues later, okay? So, and that's how we would approach it. Three, 34 residues, and I'm gonna abbreviate that RES, and I have the conversion factor of 3.6 residues per one turn. I need to cancel residues, so I'm gonna put them at the bottom per one turn, and I'm just gonna let my calculator do the rest of the work. 3.4 divided by 3.6, or sorry, 34 divided by 3.6 is 9.44 turns, okay? And how long is that? So we're just gonna build from there, 9.44 turns. I know that the conversion factor I'm looking for is 5.4 angstroms per turn. Since I need to cancel, oops. Since I need to cancel my uh, number of turns, I'm gonna say 5.4 angstroms on the top per one turn on the bottom. And once again, oh, and I should have drawn there we go. Those cancel, and it's just 9.44 times 5.4, which gives me 51. So this is 50. <coughs> Excuse me. This is 51 angstroms long or tall or whatever you want to call it, or 5.1 nanometers. Um, I'm assuming you have multiple choice exams. I don't know if that has changed due to online uh, classes. If you have multiple choice, you may see 5.1 nanometers. Don't get confused. Um, I, I've seen most of the time it's in nanometers or angstroms. I guess they could give you meters, but that's very rare. Um, but yeah, so these are the two answers that I'd be looking out for. Okay. On the other hand, if I don't want to use both 3.6 and 5.4, let's do this one. 62 amino acids, alpha helix. How long will a helix be? I can say 62 residues. And I know the conversion factor that I want to use now is 1.5 angstroms per one amino acid residue. So these get canceled, and I'm just gonna multiply 62 by 1.5 instead. Much easier. Oh, not much easier. It's really just one step less, um, but a lot of people prefer it, like I said. Number you get is 93 angstroms, or once again, 9.3 nanometers. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. So the next question is about the helical wheel. So this is a helical wheel. Um, and I, I know that there's some stuff over to the left. I'm going to ask you to ignore it. Like I said, we're using my notes just because there's a lot of information here. <laughs> um, okay. So this helical wheel tells us effectively what we're dealing with. So, and what I mean by that is we're dealing with, how do I read this? I apologize. So what the helical wheel tells us, let me restart, is how an alpha helix appears kind of from the top. So I've been drawing kind of like these pictures along the side. This is giving us a, a view from the top of the helix. So looking down on it, that's what it's telling us. So 
the reason this is really helpful is because this shows us how things want to interact. And what I mean by that is, in this case, aspartate is our first amino acid. And then, since it's about 3.6, almost four amino acids per, uh, per turn, almost a quarter of the way around is the second amino acid, another aspartate. And then another quarter-ish turn is an arginine, and then another quarter-ish turn, and we have isoleucine. And then again, and again, all the way around. And so this tells us how an alpha helix looks. This also gives us insight into whether we're dealing with a polar, a nonpolar, or an uh, amphipathic, or um, whatever it is that we're dealing with our, with our um, alpha helix. And here's how it gives us that insight. In this case, it's actually color coded for us with the blue being polar and the orange being nonpolar. But the, the takeaway that I want us to draw from is even if it weren't color coded, you could see that the polar stuff bunches together. The nonpolar, the more polar stuff. Um, there you go. All of our polar uh, amino acids tend to be near each other, and all of our nonpolar, let me change colors for this actually, and all of our nonpolar tend to be near each other. That alanine in, um, in the position on the right is a bit of an exception, and you can have a, the, the odd one or two that isn't in this configuration. But generally speaking, even though you, this is a this is both acidic and or, I'm sorry, this is both polar and nonpolar, it's amphipathic. It's effectively like split with a polar side and a nonpolar side. Um, and uh, I just want to add this: even if you have a completely polar helical wheel. You may have the odd alanine or valine or something scattered in there, but it would still be polar since it's like primarily polar and that's helping, it, right? Okay, so yeah. So now we're gonna shift gears to the beta sheet. And the beta sheet um, is, I'm gonna be honest, I don't wanna redraw all of this because it's very weird with the beta sheet. So I'm gonna give you guys an overview here and then we're gonna look at my notes some more, okay? So the way the beta sheet works is you've effectively got one sheet lined up like this, what makes it a, a beta sheet, or like this is one sheet. What we're dealing with in reality is parallel or anti-parallel beta sheets. In other words, the interactions between the sheet, are, in other words, for this to be like, the reason that we consider it a secondary structure is because two beta sheets interacting is what gives us that force. And when these two beta sheets interact, if let's say this is the N-terminus and this is the C-terminus of the first. If this is N to C, you have a parallel beta sheet. On the other hand, and I'm just going to switch to green, if you have N over here and C over here, you have an anti-parallel. So the anti-parallel is a little bit easier to envision kind of intuitively. It's just it flips right back around. The parallel could do something like this. Or, you know, and it doesn't always have to be just something like this. Uh, it could be, it's going to go over here and form an alpha helix, and then another secondary structure, and then another alpha helix, and then come finally back around like that, whatever it is. Um, but the point is that when the, when both end termin, termini, terminuses, I'm not sure how to say that in plural, when the end terminus of both sheets is on the same side of the sheet, you have a parallel. When they're on opposite sides, you have an anti-parallel. And that affects so the bonding, and with the bonding, that affects the length. And that's why we're going to look at my notes, because redrawing this is kind of a pain. Um, so what we're looking at here, I don't know if, if I can get a laser pointer or something, because that would really help out with uh, kind of just pointing at things. Um, let me see. View, maybe? Uh, no, I don't think I can. That's OK. Um, I'm just going to have to highlight. I'll highlight. That's fine. So I'm going to start with parallel. So parallel is 0.695 angstrom per two amino acid residues. Okay, this is a number to remember. The, your professor may give you the the half if you want to think of it. So 0.3, I think it's 0.347 or 0.348 per one amino acid residue. Um, whatever the case may be. And the reason that this ends up being kind of a weird number. Uh, especially compared to the anti-parallel, since the anti-parallel is just 0.65, it's it's shorter, it's a bit neater, is the anti-parallel is more stable, okay? And the reason for that is kind of in these drawings on the, the far left and the far right. So looking at this one first, 
this area. What ends up happening is when you've got this parallel sheet, your, your ends line up and your, your O's line up. If you wanna think about like that, your N terminus and your C terminus will line up on every single carbon. But the hydrogen bonding is done between the hydrogen attached to the nitrogen and the oxygen attached to the carbon, right? So in other words, we have to bond across this little gap, okay? Across the gap every single time. And so on and so forth all the way, okay? Whereas with an anti-parallel, and I will switch to, do I have another highlighting color? I do, I'll switch to four. Uh, no, I will switch, sorry, I don't expect this to take too long. I'll, I'll switch to purple. So with this, they're, they're one off of each other, if you want to think of it like that. So the C terminus of one strand is lined up with the N terminus of the other. And so we get this very nice, very smooth, flat, kind of train track looking thing or ladder or whatever you want to call it. Um, this is very, very nice. And so this is, the anti-parallel is, like it says down here, more favorable, um, which I'll switch to back to my normal highlighting, more favorable. Actually, it should be in green, shouldn't it? I apologize. And this is less favorable, just because, primarily because of that. Um, there are a few other differences. Is it down below? Nope, nope, that's, that's into my, the notes for my next question. So the other differences that I will be including here um, are, generally speaking, your anti-parallel will have hydrophobic side chains. So, uh, I need to switch back to a pen. The hydrophobic side chains, hydrophobic, all on one side, okay? Um, and, and I did kind of draw that, um, but it's a little bit unclear to tell. Um, let me just add this real quick. Whereas here, the hydrophobic side chains, side chains on both sides, okay? Now let's talk about what I mean. When we look at this, you've got, let's say, a nonpolar side chain and then another nonpolar and another nonpolar, and then you've got some polar out everywhere else. This can have hydrophobic side chains kind of anywhere. On the other hand, when we look at, I'll keep it in purple for, uh, no, I'll keep this in green. I just realized this is more consistent. Um, this has all of its nonpolar side chains all on one side. That also helps with stability because that leaves all of this side to be polar. And so everything polar is on one side, everything non-polar is on the other. It makes it just much more stable, okay? I hope that makes sense to everyone. If not, please ask. Um, always willing to explain it in a little bit more depth. Um, yeah, so I think we're gonna do just two or three more questions and then we're gonna run out of time. So I'm just gonna jump into question eight for the sake of that time. Um, again, I, I'm going to adjust these depending on the, the new syllabi or, or announcements your professors post. I just haven't gotten those yet because your professors haven't had a chance to do those, um, just because of how busy everything has been. And we'll, we'll adjust from there, okay? All right, so this question, given a protein with that length that forms anti-parallel beta sheets with half its amino acids and alpha helices with the rest, determine how long this protein is. Okay, so this is, in my opinion, probably the hardest version of these kinds of questions that you'll get, okay? And the reason is you've got kind of two or three different questions going on here. Um, I, I do wanna point out, this is not a very typical question, um, simply for the reason that, or I should say, this is not feasible in real life because you're always gonna have one or two residues that might be kind of transition. So it's not just gonna be beta sheet, beta sheet, beta sheet, beta sheet, and then same thing right on top, and then directly into an alpha helix connecting everything. There's going to be, you know, an amino acid here or there, or here or there, or whatever the case may be, that are kind of used to transition to the next secondary structure. However, that said, I think this is a really good question just to make sure that you're, you guys are good with the math. So what we're gonna do is I'm just gonna say 234, let's, let's just get half of that right away. And we're gonna be dealing with actually 117 residues for each of these. I, in my head, have split this into two questions and we'll come together at the end for it. 
So 117 residues will be in an anti-parallel beta sheet. So what I know of anti-parallel beta sheets is they're 0.65 angstroms per two residues. Residues, and we're dealing with 117 residues. Let's just multiply. So 0.65 and then divide two. The number you end up getting is 38.03. Okay, uh, and that is in Angstrom. I apologize, I should have mentioned that. Um, okay, awesome. That's the left side dealt with, now the right side. The rest is in alpha helices, so another 117 residues. And this time I'm gonna use the 1.5 angstroms per one residue. Uh, and I should have canceled the residues over here, I apologize, I keep forgetting to do that. Um, as for why I'm doing it, just so you guys are aware, it's just for consistency to make sure everyone following kind of understands why I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, okay, and we get this, and now all we have to do is add those two numbers together. So 38.03 plus 175.5, 213.5, about. 230, oh, I'm sorry, 213.5, and that's it. So this kind of involves both alpha helices and beta sheets, but all you have to do is break it down. How many residues are we dealing with? What conversion factor do I wanna use? Okay, what does that end up giving me? That's, that's the way that I always like to approach these, okay? All right, and number nine, I, I don't entirely think this is asked about often. I think it's really fascinating, and I personally quite like, um, I quite like learning about this and, and discussing it. It's not necessary. It's not 100% necessary to learn. Okay. So, okay, I just want to make sure I didn't draw anything too. Okay, good, good. All right. So, given the proline has a fixed phi angle, which secondary structures can it not be present in based on the following Ramachandran plot? So, for the y'all who don't remember, proline is right here. So, the reason that it's important that it's a fixed phi angle, so this phi angle is, is this right here. Um, is because, well, if the phi is, you know, negative 50, neg positive 50, whatever it may be, if it's fixed over here, it could never be a left-handed helix. And likewise, if it's fixed over here, it could never be a beta sheet or a right-handed helix. Um, I'm just gonna get rid of, I'm just gonna erase everything over here just so we can start fresh. Um, okay, there we go. So th the question really is, what is proline's fixed phi angle, right? Because um, that, that's what I'm getting at. Um, not sure if anyone knows. I'm just going to go ahead and spoil it if y'all would prefer. Or not prefer, I guess, if, if y'all would want to discuss it. Um, proline's phi angle is negative 60 degrees. Okay, so phi negative 60 might be somewhere around right here. So if I draw a line up, and I, I'm not the best at drawing straight lines, so maybe this won't be the best. But not bad, okay. That means that it can be a right-handed helix and it can be a beta sheet. And we know that both beta sheets are somewhere in this region. What this tells us is, oh, excuse me. What this tells us is that proline will never be found in a left-handed alpha helix, never, okay? Um, not the most important question. I've seen it asked once, maybe twice. Um, I think it's fascinating. And I think it's a really good way to make sure that we understand these Ramachandran plots. Um, which is why I ask it, but it's not like one of the things you urgently have to know, okay? All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and pause this right here. I, I understand that we could keep going, but I've already kind of rushed through like a week and a half of our reviews in, in a day. Um, so I, I do wanna give you guys time to, to go through it all in a little bit more depth. Um, just a quick reminder, pretty much everything we've talked about is pretty important for this, uh, class. I, I really want to emphasize ESI. This is, I'm going to say 99.8%. I'm 99.8% I'm sure it's going to be on your exam. Same with um, trypsin and the other, and, and some, I should say, of the other types of cleavages. Um, the overview of admin degradation and carboxypeptidases have been asked about. Not 100% sure they're consistent, but yeah, so those are just some really important things that I, I encourage y'all to, to really study well. Um, like I said before, I am in the tutoring lounge from now until, or for, starting at about 5.30.
um, just to give me a little break until 8 p.m. when we close. So if you have any questions at all, please feel free to ask them then. Um, but yeah, that's all that I have for you all today. Thank you all so much for coming and, uh, and good luck on exam.